Hello, and welcome to our webinar today with Katie Novak. Uh, we are so excited to have Katie here. Um, many of you joining us uh, know Katie's work, and uh, hopefully you'll know a bit about this terrific new book, Let Them Thrive, a playbook for helping your child succeed in school and in life. Uh, Katie, as you know, is a master teacher, uh, assistant superintendent of the Groton Dunstable Regional School District in Massachusetts, an expert on personalized learning, a dynamic speaker, uh, who currently is joining us from the great state of California. So it's very early out there, 6 a.m. So thank you, Katie, for uh, making time so early in the day for us uh, today. And um, I'm not gonna belabor the introduction. I'm just gonna say that Katie has a great presentation for you today, and we will turn it over to her right now. Katie Novak, thank you. Okay, fantastic. And, and David, even though it's 6 a.m. here, you know, the name of the game is, is really all about flexibility. And so, uh, you know, there's nothing a little alarm can't fix. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, nice to meet you all. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to make this as interactive as possible throughout this morning. And so um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we'll dive into this. So let's see here. Let me just make sure this is going to work. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen hopefully right now. Um, David, let me know if, if you cannot. But this whole concept of let them thrive is, you know, we have students who are in school and there's a lot of data that shows us that many students are, are merely compliant. They're going through the motions as they're in school. And, you know, it's not about them really like learning to be the best self, their best self. And there's so many different initiatives out there that are talking about the type of thing um, that we want students to be able to carve their own path. You know, you hear these concepts like future ready learning and personalized learning, but what does that actually mean and what's the research behind it? And, you know, UDL or Universal Design for Learning really is the research behind that. And the framework is all about allowing our students to truly thrive, to be their best selves, to learn how to be purposeful and motivated and reach for their goals and overcome obstacles and, you know, to, to understand themselves as learners, to be able to really promote their strengths, to work on their areas of weakness. And it all is about this concept of customization you know how can we create an education that works for every single student and it can absolutely happen and so far the narrative has really been about educators this whole concept of how can we create better classrooms and yet you know the reach is not as far as it could be and and this is where we really want to focus on parents um, I'm a mom of four as we all know we would move mountains for our kids and this whole concept of if we can get all parents to realize what what this personalization looks like under universal design for learning, then we can come together and move mountains and start to push that needle in education to make sure that all of our kids have an opportunity to be really successful and to thrive in the classroom. And so throughout this presentation, whenever you see a star, that's a visual reminder that we would love for you to participate. And that might mean that you enter something in the chat box. It might mean that you go onto Twitter. It might mean that if you're in a classroom um, with a group of students, I saw a a video pop up and somebody was in a room full of people, you can just talk about it. But I want this to be as interactive as possible. So as we move on today, you know, what are the goals of this webinar? The first is that you understand this concept of variability, you know, how our kids are, you know, so different from each other, but each of them has this amazing, you know, mix of these strengths and weaknesses. Um, also to know what it takes for students to actually learn, not to be students, not to sit in a class, Room, but what makes learning permanent? What makes it meaningful? And what has to happen in the brain for that to happen? And then lastly, you know, understanding what we have to transform in order to allow all of our students to thrive. Because the way that education is, is structured in many, um, many classrooms across the world is not going to meet the needs of our students today. And it definitely will not meet the needs of our students in the future. And then lastly, um, if you like what you have to hear, you may want to pick up a copy of Let them thrive to learn more about UDL and to start spreading the message among parent networks and educator networks because this is really really important work not only to celebrate and elevate teachers and teaching but to celebrate and elevate all of our students 
So as we move on, you know, think about this concept of variability as every child has, again, this amazing mix of strengths and weaknesses. Now, these are my four lovely children. Um, Torin, he is the, the one with the, the fake blonde hair. You know, it's, he's an awesome hair game. Um, but he is eight years old. He's in third grade. Um, the two bookends in that picture are my twins, Aylin and Brecken. They're six and they're in first grade. And then I have Bowden, who is two years old, and he's the little guy with the cool yellow sneakers. And he is two. So he is not in school yet. And I would do anything for my students to be successful in school, for them, my kids, to be successful as students. But what I know about them is even as a parent, I have to parent them so differently. So if you have, you know, more than one child or, you know, nieces and nephews, or if you're a classroom teacher, you know that every single child needs a very different style of parenting, of motivation, you know, their love languages are different. And sometimes some of our kids arrive to school and they're excited to learn. They're ready to learn. Every kid has these amazing strengths. And I want educators to not only see that in all my kids, but then make sure that their education aligns to those strengths and really, you know, taps into what their interests are and then helps them to work on their areas of weakness in a way that's very motivating and develops a growth mindset. And this whole concept of, well, how do you do that? You cannot do that when you teach in one way. You cannot do that when you assess in one way. This concept of a one-size-fits-all curriculum, which is the way that many of us, if you're an adult, have been educated, was that the teacher you know, did one thing. The teacher lectured and maybe we listened and we had to all take notes in the same way. Um, it was time for an assessment. Everyone got the same exact test and had to use the same materials and had to use the same methods to solve problems. And you know, that worked for some. And some people were bored out of their minds and some people were completely in over their head and feeling very anxious. And so that curriculum and that teaching that was not accessible and it wasn't engaging. And for a long time, what we tended to say was that those students are just not successful. Um, sometimes we use the term that these students are disabled, that you know they're learning disabled. And CAST and the message of UDL is arguing that students are not disabled, people are not disabled curriculum is, schools are. And this concept came from Ron Mace, who was an architect, who said that if people can't get into buildings, it's not people who are disabled, it's the buildings that are. And think about that for a moment, just that message that if you step back and you say, you know, our children are the way that they are and their variability is what makes them unique and amazing and ours. And in order for them to thrive, we cannot disable our curriculum anymore. We cannot disable our instruction anymore. We have to make sure that every student can really be successful the way that they come to school. You know, right now, schools are really, really great at providing a solid education for those kids who arrive ready and able to learn in traditional ways. And that is simply not enough. And so we have this opportunity to, create, you know, to, to unfold this framework that says, here is a playbook to do this better, you know, to make sure that all of these kids, all of my four babies, even though they're wildly different from each other, will have an awesome experience in school. And that's for my four babies and that's for the other, you know, billions of babies in the world um, that have, you know, the, the equal right and an equal opportunity to access learning that is really meaningful. And so we're going to talk and step back a little bit about this concept of what is universal design for learning. And um, I want you to use the lens for a minute. And we're coming up on the holidays. You know, we just, um, Hanukkah just started. Christmas is coming. We have New Year's. We have New Year's Eve. We have Kwanzaa. And so when you think about all of these holidays, many of us end up having parties at our house. Um, and this illustration in the, the top of your screen is an amazing illustration um, by my sister, Lindy, who did all the illustrations and let them thrive. Um, she's an amazing artist and has this amazing mind. And um, we wanted to try to provide visuals for what we were talking about. And so she's created this sketch for the book. And in this whole concept of a buffet, really works in uh, parties, you know, when we have a potluck, when we have a buffet, because what it does is it allows us to meet the needs of a bunch of different people without making 10 individual meals. And so if you're looking at the less, if you think about, um, if you look at the left of the screen, um, if you think about having a party, okay, you um, are looking at your friends and you're like, oh gosh, you know, somebody might be vegan, somebody might be sugar-free, somebody, you know, might be drinkers, some people might be drinkers. And so what you do is you start planning a menu. 
And this isn't shocking to any of us. Like these are the type of things that we just kind of do in our heads. And the thing is, is I don't even need to know my guests to do this because if I were to have a party and I didn't know my guests yet, I could still say, well, what could some of the barriers be? I might have someone, you know, who doesn't want to eat meat. It doesn't mean that they're a vegetarian. They just maybe don't like me or they don't want it. Um, you know, I might have someone else who is on a diet. So I want to make sure I have, you know, an option for something healthy. And so you start going through in your head, you know, how could I proactively create a menu so that nobody shows up and is like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat because that's disastrous. And so we kind of wrap our heads around that and say, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But then think back to like the 1970s, like my meme, bless her heart, um, you know, she's passed away. But like when she was having a party, everyone was eating pot roast. Like we got pot roast and potatoes in a pressure cooker and that's what everyone was eating. And this concept of variability just was not the norm. And so if we wanted to be thriving as um, guests, some people couldn't access the food. You know, I'm a vegetarian. I cannot access that. Some people just weren't engaged, which means I just don't want it. Like that's gross. And you know, mem, I didn't care. And we're, we're, we've moved beyond that with party planning. And so just take a moment and in the chat box or go to Twitter and think about like, you know, if you're having a party coming up, if you're having a hypothetical party, how are you going to plan your menu? What are you going to have? So every single guest can thrive. And there's a, a many different techniques. So I'd love to hear about your holiday party planning to kick this off. Um, I'm going to have to turn down my screen for a second just so I can see your chatting. I don't want to miss the chat. Okay, I might need some um, tr troubleshooting here from, from Mindy. Or, oh, there we go here. Let's see. I'm trying to see the chat here and I have not. Oh, there we go. Perfect. It's, oh, it's popping up. There we go. Okay. So um, we have Caitlin who says, I did find you, Mindy. Thank you. I have Caitlin who says, you know, have a buffet. And so this whole concept of putting out a number of things, does anyone have any ideas that is not just me making a buffet? Because, you know, a buffet, oh, nice. Okay. So this is this is not hypothetical, okay? So a newly vegan daughter. So this whole concept of saying, you know, how do I create these really great meals? Now, what we don't want to do is just drop it to one denominator. So if every meal was just vegan, um, you may have, um, Caitlin or Catherine rather, you may have, um, you know, some relatives who really love me or, you know, are very picky about vegetables. And so we want them to thrive at dinner too. And so this whole concept of, of do we have enough options for everyone? And it's not just about the options. It's also about the choice. Because sometimes when I go to a wedding, this kind of makes me mad because I really like vegetarian meals. And, you know, sometimes you'll go to a, a wedding and everyone will get chicken unless you're a vegetarian. And I'm not a vegetarian, but I would prefer vegetables to chicken. Um, and so it's this whole concept of it's not about the labels. It's not about I have to make something for my friend who's gluten free. It's about, you know, I need to have a gluten free option because some people may not be able to access or may not, you know, appreciate or like food, you know, like pasta. And so um, someone said another thing um, uh, said potluck, do a potluck. Because, you know, again, this whole concept of bring your own thing. Now, the way that this works is, for example, Torin, who's in third grade, they had kind of a potluck um, writer's workshop where they said, you know, bring in something that's really awesome and important to you that you want to write about. Um, in a one size fits all, the teacher would provide something like, you know, let's all write about the field trip we went on yesterday, as opposed to it's potluck. You know, you tell me what you're interested in. You can write about that. Um, you read the book that you want to in a high school English class, and we're going to talk about theme, but we don't all have to read the same book. Um, and, and reading could even be broader. So it's not only bring in your own book for the potluck, but, you know, Think about bringing in a, an audiobook on your phone or, you know, think about collaborative reading with a partner or creating a group for readers theater or coming over in a small group with the teacher and everyone's reading different books and different modalities and using different methods to highlight and annotate, but everyone is still meeting that standard. Everyone is still learning about theme. Um, and so what we're talking about here, I'm just reading all of these, catching up on these, um, these comments here and it's, oh, 
And when, when, so when there's something that's for me, when I'm able to contribute, I feel like I'm a part of the menu too. Um, Joanne also says labels describing the dish, multiple means of representation. How do I know there's no gluten in it? How can I make a really good decision? Now imagine the uh, magic of if schools provided the same thing for students, for your child, for your students, that they walk in and, and they have an opportunity to really self-assess, to really think about their own variability. Um, you know, the dietary variability in the holiday party, but to really think about themselves as learners and then to look and to see what their options are knowing that there's many ways to get to the same destination. There's many ways for you to fill your plate and have an awesome time at a party. And there's many ways for students to learn about theme. There's many ways for students to learn how to solve equations or learn about the industrial revolution or learn a, a world language. And we need to, to be open-minded about those possibilities. Um, uh, you know, I love it. Again, it's, it's really important to label the food to make sure that in your holiday party food that it's very, very clear that, um, you know, this is has meat in it. Um, I went to my sister's holiday party. She has this really cool cul-de-sac tree lighting and um, I made like a holiday punch. It did have vodka in it. And so I put big signs on it because, you know, it looks like this really fun, you know, there was like cranberries floating in it and then the kids are like, Ooh, I want that. And it's like, stop children. You know, I put it really high and it was, you know, make sure that everyone knows there's vodka in it. This is critical information um, at a party. So great job on the labels. Um, moving forward with this concept of UDL in the classroom. Okay. Um, a lot of the times when I go to menu, like if I go to a, uh, a, a restaurant and I see no substitutions, like my husband's like, sit down, Katie, just don't, you don't say anything, you know, it doesn't matter. But I'm like, what do you mean? No, are you kidding me? No substitutions? Like, I just have to eat this meal as it's designed. Um, and like, I, I wonder if anyone else feels that way too. Like, you know, I, I, you're, you're literally, I am paying for this food. And you're literally not going to allow me to swap something out because I can't access it or I'm not engaged with it. Um, like that doesn't make sense to me. And it's kind of, I, I try to use the same lens as a classroom teacher, as an administrator, and as a parent of, we have to provide an education that has substitutions. You know, we can't just say, you know, everyone has to complete this exact thing in this way. But to say, here are your options. You know, I want everyone to be able to do this. And here are your options. And if you need to make substitutions, if you need to use an exemplar or a graphic organizer or sit on the floor or, you know, listen to music or chew gum or have a snack or, you know, go to a separate space like the library because you need quiet or, you know, work with a partner. Like, why can't we allow those substitutions? Because, you know, we use this argument of like, well, when they grow up, they're not going to have those options. Oh, I, but I do. I do every day at work. Um, you could ask any of my colleagues. I like basically buzz around the office on this saddle stool. Um, and that is an option for me professionally. And, you know, so why don't we offer that same option for our kids? Now, whether or not you're a parent or an educator, you can answer this question. Um, but if you could make a substitution and how I, your kids use the word kids loosely as like your own children or your student children, you know, your babies in the classroom, whether they're, you know, 12th grade or pre-K and, you know, think about what would you create substitutes for, you know, where do we need more options? And then again, I'm going to jump out and try to find this, this uh, chat so I can make sure to interact. I'm also going to check Twitter really quickly just to make sure I'm not missing anything there, but think about what are you going to provide or what if you could have like a magic wand and say, oh gosh, I really wish there were substitutions for this. What would it be? I'm writing back to Lindsay right now. She says, does the book talk about ways to advocate for choices and option? Um, there's actually a chapter at the end called call to action. So I'm going to say, yes, it absolutely does. Um, but this whole concept of, you know, how do you advocate for this is the first thing is, is everyone's doing it right now. You're exploring and you're educating yourself. There is a framework based on 30 years of brain-based research that says that this is the most effective way to teach students. And again, we hear all this amazing talk about personalized learning and, you know, um, allowing students to be future ready and passion projects and um, genius hour and all of these different, you know, wonderful tools are built on the back of UDL's research. 
And so when you know what UDL is, you also hold like a very special card because the federal legislation and Let Them Thrive talks about this, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced No Child Left Behind, actually endorses Universal Design for Learning as the framework. It talks about it seven different times um, about the framework to meet the needs of all students. And knowing that every state is moving towards inclusive practice, you know, UDL is the underbelly of what that means. Um, so I'm reading from, um, you know, Anne is talking about, like, I wish I could substitute just the, the labels, just the disabilities. You know, kids are kids are kids. And there is no such thing as a disabled learner in UDL. There's just different learners, and we value all of them and their variability. And the only reason we ever said they were disabled was because they couldn't fit a one-size-fits-all curriculum that we created. And David Rose once said to me, um, he's the, the, you know, one of the fathers, the founding fathers of UDL and CAST, um, he he once said to me, and, and you have to kind of step back and, and think about the, the power of this message, is he says the reason that we have to have IEPs is because our system is broken that an IEP is, is, is almost like a, a it, it's an accommodation for a broken system because in a system that truly valued every student as a learner, one would not need a legal document to make sure that students have everything they need. It would just be embedded in every classroom. And if you step back and think about that, I really think that is what, um, um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to see, I wanted to give the person credit for saying, you know, who talked about this concept of wanting to see students for their um, level of ability, but this whole concept of, uh, let's see, who was it? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's going so fast that I can't go back and see. Um, but this concept of that, you know, students, I can't say it enough. Students are not disabled. Curriculums are, you know, curriculum is systems are and and we are, you know, very much able to, you know, navigate that and make huge improvements in these systems by removing the systematic barriers that led us to this perception that students were disabled. Um, those barriers can be removed when we provide substitutions and options. And so, you know, there's so many different things about flexible seating, um, choice and voice. Um, going through this whole concept of um, connecting more with parents, you know, having options or, you know, having options for parents to come in and be more a part of the classroom. Um, this concept of substitutions with in standardized assessments. CAST is very, very much fighting for that. Um, this whole concept of, you know, not if we if we agree in the legislation that not all students can express knowledge in the same way. Why are we then measuring knowledge in the same way? Um, so a really powerful platform. I love to see all of these, the concepts about, um, you know, allowing students to embrace their energy. Oh, Mindy is amazing in the chat box. We're going, oh my goodness. I have like these two, it's like having these two little like cartoon muses on my shoulder that every time I say something, a link pops up so you can learn more about it. Talk about UDL, you know, the option to learn more is so very cool. And so the, the thing is, is that it is absolutely within the scope of our responsibility as educators and parents to advocate for these additional options, for these substitutions, as you will. Because if one thing doesn't work, something else will. And that's what it means to be an expert learner. And so, you know, I, the waterfall of comments is so amazing, but if I, if I look at them, I'm, you, then you're going to see me like this for the rest of the time. So I'm going to keep swimming here. Um, it, you know, another illustration in the book is this concept of, you know, some of our children, and again, students and our actual, you know, our, our babies, um, some of them will take a very different long path to get to the same destination. We call that adventure. <laughs> we call that, you know, expert learning, and it's awesome. And um, this concept of choice is, you know, some students need like really specific, um, a very specific, you know, kind of map for a path. And one of my favorite um, uh, skits of all time is from Hallie met, uh, Sally. Sally met Harry, when Harry met Sally, and um, she's ordering pie. And if you haven't seen this, this to me captures what it means to be an expert learner. Like I, when I taught, wanted to have a classroom that my students knew without a doubt that when I said, okay, this is what I'm thinking about 
for our project. You know, I, you know, I want us to read, you know, one of these couple of things, you can read it, you can listen to it. I'm thinking about this for an assessment, but I want you to think about, is there another way that you could meet that standard? You know, I taught, I taught seventh grade and would sit together and would say, if you have a better way to do this, like, please challenge me. And I always would tell them about like, I want you to be Sally. So this is Sally. Um, there is um, a, a document that will transcribe this document. We couldn't put in the closed captions, but if you want the transcript, it will be available. What can I get you? I'll have a number three. I'd like the chef salad, please, with the oil and vinegar on the side and the apple pie a la mode. Chef and apple a la mode. But I'd like the pie heated, and I don't want the ice cream on top. I want it on the side, and I'd like strawberry instead of vanilla if you have it. If not, then no ice cream, just whipped cream, but only if it's real, if it's out of a can, then nothing. Not even the pie? No, just the pie, but then not heated. Uh-huh. What? Nice, nice. So like that for me is like the, that is what I want education to be. That is what I, I dedicate, you know, my craft is so education can be like that and you don't get the, oh, no, nothing. It's just like, okay, cool. That makes sense to me. Um, and so this concept of having different paths, we need to know, well, how do students know how to craft this path? How can we as parents become involved um, with teachers and, and become champions together for creating these paths? And in order to do that, we have to really understand how do kids learn? Um, I use an analogy in Let Them Thrive of a heating system. Um, you know, maybe this doesn't work for you because right now I'm on AC, not heat. So we'll think of it of an HVAC system, uh, you know, heating and cooling, depending on where you happen to be in the country. But let's just talk about a heating system for a moment before you worry about what's happening up here in our brains. Is if I want heat to work, okay, I'm in my house, you know, I'm in Boston over the weekend, we got like seven inches of snow, you know, in, in Rotten, Massachusetts and it was cold in my house. And so what I had to do is I had to tell my house to warm up. I wanted some sort of assessment at the end. I needed a product to show the house was warm. And so first what I had to do is I had to activate the heating system by going to the thermostat and making it very, very clear what I wanted. You know, I had to heighten the salience of goals and objective very, very, very clearly. And I had to communicate that in a way that the thermostat like understood, like I totally understand what I have to do. This makes sense to me. Okay. So I go in and I plug in 72. It's my favorite temperature. And um, when I, when I plug it in, that's great. Okay. I've activated the system, but I still don't have heat because now the thermostat has to communicate with the burner. Okay, so the burner has to receive that message. It has to comprehend that message, no matter what. Because I could put on 30, 30, 72 in the thermostat, which is like literally, that is like comfort in a nutshell. When it's summer, it can be 72. When it's winter, it can be 72. And so I need my burner to recognize Okay, or comprehend that message and say, oh, okay, I'm receiving a message. I completely understand it. Okay, this makes so much sense to me, but that's not enough. Okay, now I need to know, is that message received? Where's my output? And this is when the burner can, um, is actually communicating with the blower. Okay, and the blower pushes out heat, and then I have some sort of product, okay? And I said, oh, the thermostat definitely understood the message. You know, it, it received the message. It was able to communicate the message, and now I have this output. And when we think about learning, we think about the same thing with the brains, is that students have this effective network in the core of their brain. And this is basically like the light bulb that turns everything on, which is, why am I even doing this? Like, you know, and students ask that all the time. If you're a teacher, you know that. Why are we doing that? And it's basically like you need a really good reason as to why we're doing this. Like I need to get students' attention. Okay, so everyone, you know, the standard is we all have to understand theme. You're probably wondering why is it important to understand theme? Let me tell you why it's so cool to understand theme. Let me tell you how you can use this and how you can navigate the world and why it's awesome. And then I have their attention, but now I have to build their commitment because we still have to go through this long process of interpreting this message and expressing this message. And so I have to build motivation. I have to build purpose. And in order to do that, I have to have very different levels of challenge. Because if I'm going to get students excited to do something, I can't have them be bored and I can't have them be overwhelmed. 
And so I start saying, you know, don't worry about it. Like, I want you all to challenge yourselves. And there's going to be so many different ways that you can do this. And it's totally fine if we make mistakes. If you bite off something you can't chew, we're going to be able to revise it. You know, this is not going to impact your grade negatively. Don't worry. Like, this is a process. Um, you can work together at the beginning. I'm going to foster collaboration and community. I'm going to help them to cope. I'm going to say, even though this is hard, you know, it's okay. You know, we have flexible seating. You know, I let you have snacks whenever you want. You know, I'm always available you know, for, for help. I have all those scaffolds in the back. I'm priming the thermostat. And, you know, too often, I think, you know, we look at curriculum as not the standard, not the goal. Like, what is the goal of this lesson? You know, so if you're to say, um, the goal of this lesson is we, re we read Charlotte's Web, that's, that's not a standard, you know, that's nothing to reach. That's, you know, an activity. Why? Why are we reading Charlotte's Web? Oh, we're reading it because I want them to understand about friendship. If my goal is friendship, I have about a thousand ways I can teach students to understand friendship and it doesn't have to be Charlotte's Web. And so I, I prime the why. Now I have to teach something, okay? And teaching, I'm using that term not as me necessarily as a direct instruction, but I need a lot of different ways for students to comprehend you know, okay, so I need to know, understand the theme of friendship. Well, how do I do that? You have to know what theme is. You have to know about author's craft. You know, you have to understand, you know, about word choice and, and, and you know, the plot curve. And I'm, I'm using an English example right now because I was an English teacher. But this whole concept of, well, what are all the different ways that I can have students answer the question, what is it that I'm supposed to know? It might be me presenting. It might be videos. It might be students reading. It might be them working together. It might be, um, you know, uh, building their own knowledge, you know, on online and exploring things themselves. And so, you know, when you step back and you think about, there's a lot of ways for students to learn information. You know, if I told you all right now, you know, go out and find out as much as the industrial revolution that you can, some of you would be calling, you know, people that you know who are in the history department. Some people would immediately go online. Some people would sit down and try to list what is everything I know about it. Um, some people would go find a video. Those are all actually great ways to learn, and we need to offer them to our students. Now, we have primed the pump, okay? We have activated this concept of we have, you know, we have knowledge. How do we know if it landed? Okay, and that's the strategic network, which is what we think of as assessment. Students have to somehow express to us what they know. And again, if I want to know that you understand theme, um, it doesn't have to be an essay because my standard is not a writing standard, it's a, an, a content standard, which means I want to know that you know something, that you understand something. And so you could do that in a video with a green screen, um, by putting on a skit, by creating a poem, by writing an essay, by taking a traditional test when I mean, we have them already, um, you know, sitting in books and to say, you know, what is the way that you want to show me that you know this? And some people worry about, you know, well, what about the standardized tests? Okay. Standardized tests are designed to measure the standards. If you teach the standards in a really accessible, universally designed way, students will know what they need to know and they'll be able to do what they need to do. Because, you know, writing is a standard and, and we'll have a lot of choices for writing. What do you want to write about? Um, you know, what tools do you want to use to write? You know, do you want a keyboard? Do you want to write it by hand? Um, and so there's options everywhere. And so if we don't activate these three networks of the brain, you end up with a broken system, a broken heating system, and you don't get heat. And so some of our, our students are struggling at the thermostat stage where they're just like, I don't even know why this is important. This is stupid. Or they are interested, but the level of challenge is so significant and there's not enough options or substitutes to cope with that, um, that they, they break down there. Okay, some students are really interested and committed, but the way that we're teaching it is just simply not accessible or engaging. And then we can get some students past that point and they really know it. They really have that information, but we don't have the right option for them to express what they know and for us to be able to see that. And so UDL is all about what are the strategies that activate those networks of the brain so that we have this really fluid HVAC system. And this brings us to the UDL guidelines. And, um, you know, I'm not going to keep this slide up long enough to really like get into it and read it. But these are the strategies that have been shown over the course of decades to have really, really high returns on investment of learning. And what you'll notice is there's nine of them and they align to the three principles of UDL. Um, you know, if I want to activate the recognition network, I need to provide multiple means of representation. How do I do that? You'll see the numbers one, two, and three, but all of them say, 
provide options, provide options, provide options. Um, what you'll notice about number seven is it says provide options for recruiting interest and 7.1 says optimize choice. So it's not enough to have options if students don't have choices. So you might say, oh, I have a lot of options for the way I teach. So, you know, one day I lecture for an hour, you know, the next day we read a book, the next day we read a video, for example. Um, so those are different options, different teaching options, but students never have a choice. And therefore, the thermostat has not been turned on. And so, you know, in Let Them Thrive, it actually goes through, it unpacks these guidelines. It talks about how you would use them not only as a teacher, but how you would use them as a parent, how you could plan a party using them to unpack those a little bit more. But the goal of these is if you look at the bottom row, the goal of UDL, the goal of activating these three brain networks, the goal of these three UDL principles is that we create learners who are resourceful, knowledgeable, strategic, goal-directed, purposeful, and motivated. And that's what an expert learner is. It's not a good student. Okay, you could have a student who gets really good grades that is not an expert learner because they don't know how to suggest alternatives and substitutions and they don't know how to express their knowledge in creative and innovative ways or they don't care. Um, and that's your purpose and motivation issue. And so creating a framework that has, you know, educators looking at this allows us to say, wow, like there's a lot of different ways to get to the same goal. Um, Let Them Thrive also talks about how you use them as parents, as actual parenting. So, you know, what does it mean? You know, I want my, my kids to clean their rooms. How do I use UDL to make that happen? Um, we all have standards. We have parenting standards. We have teaching standards. So, you know, I want students to understand the life cycle of a plant um, in the classroom, but at home, I want my students or my kids to make their own lunch. And how does that, what does that look like? You know, my kids make their own lunch. They're, you know, eight and six years old. So how did I optimize UDL to get there? And again, you can learn a little bit more about that um, in, in the book if you're interested in reading it. So this, why do we do this? Why is it so critical that we provide all of these options and choices? And it really comes down to this concept of we want all of our kids to be able to thrive in the future. And so what does that mean? It means they have these four buckets of skills. Now, school is really... Mm, School is solid at the first one. I wouldn't say really great because again, some students go through school and they do not leave you know, with an ability to read um, and write and, and have a basic understanding of numeracy. And again, in universal design for learning, those terms are far more fluid because reading may mean you know, um, interacting with audiobooks, being able to read uh, artwork or text. Um, the same with writing. Um, you could write using a dragon naturally speaking. Um, it could be keyboarding. And so you just think about you know opening up those definitions but school for a very long time has been largely focused on just this core knowledge like well we can't do that because I have to get to all this content um, but now what does it mean to be future ready or you might hear next generation learner or you might hear 21st century learner these are terms that are thrown around a lot in education um, and what that really means is we have an equal responsibility to teach students how to learn how to be innovative how to create skills that will allow them to be really successful in their life and their careers, and then also um, to, to know how to navigate and interact with and use technology as a resource and as a means of expression um, and, and as a means to, to be engaged. And so we need a very different framework for that because curriculum, for the most part, is not designed to teach those other skills. Um, we're getting there. The, you know, the, the nation just adopted new science standards, which are called the Next Generation Science standards, which are all about this concept of learning and innovation. It's about problem solving and collaboration. And, but, but this is what we want for our kids. So if you just take a moment, whether you're a teacher or a parent, like imagine if a student could leave every year, not only learning what it means to be purposeful and motivated, not only having a myriad of options for how they learn and how they express what they know and how they work with other people and how they sit and how they cope. In addition to that, imagine that they learn how to solve problems, how they, you know, they learn to communicate with one another, the opportunity to be really creative and do things in different ways, to learn how to be leaders, to be flexible, like, you know, you know what, I can sleep four hours a night and get up in the morning, that's awesome, because I'm motivated to do something, and I know there's always a way to make it work, but how can we instill that magic at home, 
and in schools. And so it's our responsibility as well. And there's a lot of parenting books that are just focused wholly on parenting that talk about the same thing. Um, the Gift of Failure by Jess Leahy, Peak, um, I, I don't remember the author on Peak, you know, Start with the Why, The Whole Brain Child, you know, all of these books which are really geared away from education are all about the fact that we need kids to grow up and be okay with bouncing back from failure. You know, understanding that learning and success is a process. People who are wildly successful kept going and when other people quit. And that's what it comes down to. And it means they learned how to solve problems and communicate their way out of it um, and use other people to, to be able to move forward and self-direct towards their goal. So why is this more critical now than it's ever been? And what this comes down to is, um, when our, um, you know, any child now who's not in high school, when they grow up, they're going to be doing jobs that don't exist yet. And this is a really powerful slide. This is from the um, US Department of Labor Statistics. And they basically talk about job trends and where jobs are going. And what you can see is back in 1980, um, there were equal numbers of jobs in these first three categories. I don't love the names of the categories. Um, this is literally from the US Department of Labor, but they talk about non-routine cognitive jobs, routine cognitive jobs, routine non-cognitive jobs, um, and that's just basically like the type of work. Now, non-cognitive jobs require, I'm gonna flip back for a second, all of the skills that you see here on the slide, okay? So it requires education, which means there needs to be some basic reading, writing, numeracy, but all this other, all, this, all these other skills, that's what it means to be cognitive. Okay, um, it means you can think critically, you can solve problems, you can communicate, you can collaborate, you can take a leadership role. So if you think about non-routine cognitive, these are jobs that require all this critical thinking, problem solving, communication, leadership, you know, teachers, administrators, you have to constantly be collaborating, being flexible, um, you know, being able to self-direct and plan. Um, and you also have to have a pretty solid background in education. You know, there's, there's generally subject matter tests in order to, to do this. And it doesn't have to be traditional education. We're thinking about doctors and architects, um, but you know, your, your most um, amazing plumbers and electricians are very highly educated in their craft through apprenticeships and things like that. Um, and so those jobs, as you can see, are on like a, an amazing uptick. Okay, and what's really scary, there's a lot of research out there now that the people on those blue lines if you can see color, it's the top line, um, are actually seeing the bottom three lines as problems to be solved. Now just think about that for a moment, is the bottom jobs, you know, if you think of the examples that the US Department of Labor gives, you know, um, like administrative assistants and manufacturing um, and, and waiters, that is being replaced really, really quickly by technology. Um, and so, you know, we have transcription software, you know, we have, you know, automatic um, letters from, you know, um, lawyers. When you call your bank, um, you don't talk to a person, you know, you talk to a machine. That used to be somebody's job sitting at a desk. Um, manufacturing jobs, you know, will go to robots likely. Um, when um, the, the nation was able to keep those thousand jobs from carrier, um, the, the Trump administration was able to keep those thousand jobs here in the US, there were a lot of articles that said, you know, that's good for now, but whether we move those jobs or not, they're gonna be gone in 10 years. Um, it's simply, we won't have people in manufacturing plants that aren't highly trained engineers or well-educated machinists. Um, you know, you think about this concept of waiters, you know, even the Olive Garden now, I went to the Olive Garden with my kids a couple weeks ago, and I sat down and there was just an iPad, like I just had to do it by myself. And so if we want our kids to be moving up on that line, um, the argument is that the three bottom lines will meet and go down. And so it's going to be a have and have nots. And so our kids need to learn how to be creative and innovative and solve problems. And when we give them options and when we provide an education that says, you do it your way, buddy, like your way is going to be awesome. Because if we all do it in the same way, like we did, we are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. So, you know, just take a moment, um, you know, just two minutes here and just thinking about, you know, so what are teachers up against and why isn't this something that everybody just does? Okay. And I am like, uh, I'm a thousand percent on, you know, on team teacher and on team parent. You know, I believe in elevating and celebrating the craft of teachers and teaching. Um, and I, and when I work with teachers, everybody's like, oh my gosh, I love this. But here's the barriers that I'm facing. Like, I want to do this, but here's the barriers that I'm facing. And so I just want to tell you about some of those barriers really quickly. Um, again, standards are a destination. 
They are not a journey. There is not a single common core standard that will tell you how you need to do things. Um, one thing I see on Facebook all the time is look at this common core math problem. There is literally no such thing as a common core math problem. If you go to the common core, you won't see any endorsed curriculum. You will not see any math problems. It's all about like use different ways to solve a problem. Okay, now that you know about 21st century skills, you go, oh, that makes sense, you know, that we want students to not look at math in a formulaic, like two plus two equals four, but like, how do you know that? Because a computer and a calculator can do two plus two equals four. So what happens is districts have to make decisions about what curriculum they're gonna adopt. It takes a very long time to make a homegrown curriculum. So if you were to truly universally design a, a class from the ground up, um, that would take a lot of time. And so many, um, many districts decide to adopt curriculum. What you are now purchasing is Pearson's or Houghton Mifflin, those are big textbook publishers, their interpretation of those standards, and then many systems require teachers to follow those scripts. And so when you are talking to a teacher and you might advocate and say like, hey, I just learned about this amazing framework. You know, I hear that it's, you know, it's endorsed in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Like, it sounds amazing. You're gonna have teachers who are like, oh, I would love to do that. I would love to. And, and then it's like, well, well, why can't you? And, and the barrier sometimes is, well, I have to use this curriculum. The good news is, is that school boards, um, school committees, school boards, uh, you know, I, I'm an assistant superintendent. I work with an amazing school board. Um, they actually have the final say in, you know, uh, in hearing out which curriculum we're adopting and why. Um, and our policy encourages parents to be a part of that. And many people just don't know, um, you know, what the curriculum adoption process is. But one thing you could do is like, what is your curriculum adoption process? Because districts have one. Um, we actually have a protocol, how many programs you have to use. We have to fill out a rubric um, about like, these are the things we're looking for. You know, we don't want any bias. We want different levels of challenge. Um, and then we also allow our teachers to, um, you know, create workshop models and, and bring in and supplement their own ideas so they can provide additional substitutes and options. Um, some districts, I can tell you in working with some of them, do not um, provide teachers with that autonomy yet. Um, knowing that, it's an amazing opportunity to number one, learn what the standards say, number two, learn what the curriculum adoption process is, and then fight on behalf of teachers who literally want the same thing for your kids as you do. Every teacher I have ever met, you know, I say in the book, like these people would put themselves in front of a bullet for your kid. They will do anything for them to be successful. A lot of the times they are in systems that are disabled and we need to deconstruct those systems to allow teachers to be really successful. Uh, another thing that teachers are up against is this concept of teaching to the test. Again, I can tell you that it's not about teaching to the test. It's about teaching to the standards. But again, you adopt a curriculum that often tells you how to teach to the standards. Um, and so it's a bigger question than what is my seventh grade teacher doing? What is my 12th grade teacher doing? But actually having conversations to try to figure out, well, why? And, and not in a combative way, but like, I know that you want what's best for my kid. I know that I want what's best for my kid. Um, how do we do that together? And those conversations, that call to action, you know, is what the book is really about, is helping parents understand where teachers are coming from so you can best become a partner in understanding what are the best things that we can do to help the teaching profession and elevate it and celebrate it. So another quick chat box here, you know, what is one aha moment that you've had a business about this concept of what teachers are up against or standardization? or next generation skills um, and um, let's see oh, okay so someone says can you talk about the differences between database decision making with regard to teaching to the test versus database decision making with regard to informing instruction um, you know when teachers use assessments or when they ask students for their feedback um, we have a lot of different data points through diagnostic assessments which is when you give a test before you teach something just to have a sense of where students are at. You know, it doesn't count for a grade, but it's like, let me see how much you know about this. Um, you know, that provides you with very rich data to say, okay, what kind of options am I gonna need for my students moving forward in order for them to learn? Um, the same thing on formative assessments. That's an assessment that you give kind of as a midpoint to see, you know, you're really measuring how is my teaching? 
And the data that you get from that will allow you to say, uh-oh, students are really struggling with this. I clearly need more scaffolds or more options here. And so UDL is, is a, always this recursive loop of like, what evidence do I have that students are learning? What feedback am I getting from students about my own teaching? Um, and, and then how do I translate that into better options and stronger instructional opportunities as opposed to I just need to get that number up on that final standardized test. So very good question and I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, again, um, Jennifer noted that in Canada, you know, also we are really talking about this idea of multiple representations, um, you know, to say you have the option to use manipulatives, you have an option to, you know, to work together, you know, you have an option to watch a Khan Academy video if, if my instruction isn't working for you. You can come over here in a small group with me and I'll explain it and break it down more. All of those different options, you know, require teachers to, you know, be expert learners themselves, you know, really flexible and, and you know, innovative and creative. And so um, moving forward, we're, you know, coming on down in the last couple of slides, this concept of a call to action is, you know, um, in the book, I use a quote, um, you know, I, I cited it from another source, but it talks about that, again, we are instruments of change. And, you know, in the call to action chapter, it's like, you know, once you understand, once you take the time to learn about UDL, and this has been a very quick and dirty webinar to kind of like get you to, to understand the overall framework and concept, but, you know, the book really unpacks what it is and what it means not only as a teacher but as a parent then what do you do about it um, you know one of the concepts is this concept is, is to dare to dialogue start talking about it you know start a book club we have book clubs all the time um, with my girlfriends and we'll get together for wine but we're not reading nonfiction books about how to improve education um, we're reading amazing books like the nightingale um, you know about the the French occupation but you know, what about starting a book club about how we can better meet the needs of our kids in schools? Um, you know, PTOs are are generally amazing sources of support. You know, for teachers and new initiatives, and you know, things like our PTO has very widely supported our flexible seating initiative, for example. Um, you know, coming to talk about other parents, it's a platform to say this is amazing, and it's literally in federal legislation. Like, let's figure out how to get our district to do it. You know, I mean, this is literally other districts are doing it and having these amazing results. Like, what does it look like? I want it here. Um, another thing is to attend school committee meetings. Um, they just did this really large scale study. I talk about it in the book um, that less than 25% of, of parents have like in, in the study have like ever gone to a school committee meeting. Um, and that the school committee is the governing body of a school district. They make the decisions about the direction in which a school district is going and what budget priorities are. And our school committee is like amazingly informed about UDL. I mean, you could ask anyone on our school committee questions about UDL and they could literally have an awesome conversation about what it is because we've worked so hard together you know, to, to say, okay, this is what it is, you know, push back on me and, and, and work together. Um, another really important step here is that, you know, I honest to goodness believe that teachers do the best they can with what they have. Um, what are they being taught? Teachers are learners. We're all learners. You know, right now you're learning and our teachers are learning about pedagogy. And there are some districts that simply have never introduced this to teachers. Um, what are teachers getting for professional development? You know, every, every district, um, you know, has a district in improvement plan, goals about what they're trying to do. Um, is UDL a part of it? If not, you know, what's, what, it, what is it? What's the plan? Um, and then lastly, this really comes down to effective teachers and teaching. And, you know, to, to not look at teachers as, you know, it's parents and then teachers, but we're all trying to create amazing children. And the closer that we can work together, the more that we can communicate, the more that we can help each other to have a very similar framework, both at home and at school, um, we eliminate some of those barriers that prevent our students from really flourishing. Um, and so again, some, some uh, opportunities to collaborate with teachers um, as parents are, are outlined in call to action as well. Um, the last thing I want to share with you is just this concept. If you can see this, um, this visual, it's called a multi-tiered system of support. Um, again, this is a, a federal um, requirement essentially for teachers to um, respond when students aren't learning. Somebody made that great comment about how you use data as an everyday instructional tool to improve teaching and learning. Um, and um, 
all of us are required to do that, you know, to respond when kids don't learn. And for a long time, they called it RTI or response to intervention, which is that little triangle in the middle. And um, the, the whole concept of RTI was that every child can learn together in a tier one bottom pyramid inclusive classroom um, all the federal legislation all the money for title one and, and title three which provides districts with extra money um, for you know helping students who you know um, are coming from low income or are significantly struggling it says that you cannot supplant their education you must supplement it you can't take something away um, and give something back but every student deserves a very rich experience to be in classmates with their age mate peers being exposed to grade level rigor in a universally designed way and if they do not then we have to target that and at that point it's very complementary with differentiated instruction because at some point teachers do respond and provide targeted intervention to help students eliminate those barriers and sometimes it's more intensive um, but in order for that to work in order us to to use that response to intervention triangle teaching and learning and assessments the orange circle around it has to be universally designed. If it doesn't, tier one or universal instruction is not accessible to all students or it is not engaging for all students because either students cannot access the instruction or it is not engaging at all. You know, it's, it's too boring or it's not relevant and they don't know why they're doing it and so they simply choose not to as a coping strategy. Whereas every one of our kids has a passion. Period, end of story. A part of their strengths is they all want to be somebody amazing and schools have an obligation to help them to get there and it doesn't work the way that we're doing it. You know, we have to change things. We have to transform. We have to create next generation kids who are creative, who know how to personalize, but we need a framework to do that. And so what you'll notice in the outer circle of what we call a multi-tiered system is if we want all kids to be in a universal tier one classroom together also receive interventions and supports when necessary. Um, we need to make sure teaching and learning and assessments are universally designed. How do we make sure that teaching, learning and assessments are universally designed? That's where we see that outer circle. We need leadership to fight to create systems that allow this to happen. And in order to do this, you need a long-term integrated and sustainable plan for things like staffing and scheduling and curriculum adoption, as I said, and how you're gonna interpret the standards. And you really need very strong professional development because teachers are learners. And if given these tools, they will move mountains for your kids with you. Again, I work with teachers all day. It is the best job in the world. I loved teaching. You know, I feel a calling to the craft. And teachers face a lot of barriers today um, which is why even though I've been doing this work for years at an education level you know and speaking with cast I'm like we're not moving the needle enough like teachers need champions as well because teachers can't be champions for your kids without a really strong multi-tiered system of support to support them and so the book unpacks that a little bit as well and how you can intervene in each of those areas so just as a final slide here, you know, you can choose any one of these three questions. You have an option as always. <clears throat> and to think about, you know, what questions do you have? You know, what do you want to do for your call of action? Um, is there any next steps you could take? Is there anything that CAS can do to support you? Um, and so you just have um, about three minutes here to just put in your final thoughts um, about this concept. And, you know, again, um, if you want to learn more about UDL, CAS is an amazing resource. If you're an educator, um, the book UDL Now is written specifically for teachers about how to do this. But in order to dismantle the system, we really need all hands on deck. And that's what Let Them Thrive does, is it helps parents understand not only what it means to parent in a universally designed way, but what the possibilities are for a universally designed classroom and how it will allow our kids to thrive. And then most importantly, how we can work together and actually make that happen if we answer that call to action. Oh, Jasmine. Oh, Jennifer says, have you ever spoke in Canada? I have made my way up to Canada many times. Um, I do have to say my schedule is is already booked until um, January of 2019. So if you're looking at your integrated and sustainable professional development plan, um, definitely reach out to me or reach out to CAST. CAST has an awesome professional learning team as well. Um, and they could get you somebody really amazing uh, much sooner if you're just ready to go. Well, Katie, thank you so much. What a, what a terrific uh, webinar this has been. And uh, 
One of my favorite uh, chapters in the book is What Teachers Are Up Against. I think this book is a fabulous way, both for parents, but also for teachers, uh, to really begin that necessary dialogue. So I think that uh, uh, it's really important for teachers to engage parents, as they try to do, and, uh, and for parents to really understand what teachers are up against and, and understand uh, ways that they can help at home to improve what happens in the classroom. Get the book. It's terrific. Uh, reach out to us here at CAST if you have any questions. Um, share the transcript, which will be coming out uh, probably early next week, I would guess. Uh, when you get it, feel free to share it with your colleagues. And uh, have a fabulous day. And thank you for joining us today. Signing off. Thanks, Katie. My pleasure.